thanks to everybody for joining and for manan and manish you know for both of you guys to take out the time this is now the 23rd edition of sas talks and alok and i keep wondering that we never thought ki itne honge wala hum jaise 10 honge and then you know life will be fine uh, so and it's always good and fun to do this and this time around we have a topic i think that comes up very frequently in our discussion with founders which is the following that you are at the stage where the early customers you know whether you can call them design partners or you can call them ki jo hasal se haath pair mar ke kahin se bhi you know haath jod ke pair jod ke whatever customers we get and therefore call them design partners to make life easier you have you have the customers you are starting to see good early signals starting to get also clarity on you know what's the problem statement and therefore what we need to build at that point what is the go to market organization or how do you even start creating a go to market organization to begin with right uh, and across all dimensions i mean should we hire in the sales team first should we hire in the marketing team first should we hire in the customer success team first you know do we hire senior folks uh, and let them build out a team do we hire relatively junior folks on the grounds up because we still need a lot to learn and intent really was to uh, you know for manan and manish for both of you and then also because everybody else can participate later uh, to help answer some of those questions uh, and before you know we start getting into some of the context setting questions quick introduction to manish and manan manish is the founder at hivo data uh, i have not interacted deeply with manish i think we have probably spoken once uh, but alok only has amazing things to say about you uh i think for both the fact that uh, you have been at this journey for quite a while seen i would say a lot of ups and downs as well in the process and have created what is relatively still a little bit of a rarity in indian saas which is an infrastructure company because predominantly so far we have been creating more application oriented companies as opposed to infrastructure oriented companies and a very good one at that uh and manan is you know one of the founders at recruiter flow uh so they provide software to independent staffing and recruiting agencies to help manage all aspects of their business uh again i would say one of the most persistent and thoughtful founders uh, that at least we have had the pleasure of interacting with in quite a while uh so that's you know so without further ado at least one question both of you you know manan and manish that when you found yourself at that stage which i just described where the design partners were done there were at least some early positive signals how did you go about building your go to market organization at that point of time and you know any one of you guys can go first all right manish you want to take that up first i can do that uh i, I think uh, i often think uh, now i can clearly articulate it better than uh, what i could do back in the day but uh, in my view in the today's world like when software is becoming more and more commodity you have to start thinking that at each stage something becomes a table stake right so thinking your positioning in the market right where the market is and what role you are going to play in that market is the first steps in identifying that how should your go to market be right uh now when i say that are we basically if if there is a need which no one is really talking about is that the problem that we are trying to solve is there like a very wide space uh where the problem is solved but there is a sub segment of that market that is not well catered is that the segment that and we are uh aiming that we will solve that problem better is that the segment that we are going after or it's a completely business model differentiation say the likes of fresh works uh etc so uh the first step to think about is that what does the landscape look like and where we fall in that landscape the second aspect looks like that identify the stage of the uh user at which you want to catch them so if if the user for whom you are solving the problem if they really do they really understand do they have a problem or they don't even understand do they have the problem or not if they understand they have the problem do you, do they really actively look for a solution or they understand the problem but they are not the activation energy is not high enough for them to go and look for a solution right 
if they are looking for a solution then what are the things that they are going to search for it right so that the answer to some of these questions will basically narrow down two or three different options for you for example if the, if someone doesn't even know that this problem exists and i could get benefited by solving this problem right and it can happen a lot that like for example something like what fix the user would not themselves know that this problem can be solved in a very different way so someone has to come and illuminate the thought process that okay this is how you could solve the problem right and then there are categories where if you can articulate the problem to the user and user will say that oh this is the problem that i have been struggling badly with you like but how how will that be solved right so in both scenarios the way to reach to that customer will be that you will have to actively reach out to the customer while in another case the effort required to make the user understand the problem may be very different while in the other case you just have to illuminate the problem right or there may be scenarios that user are searching for something and then you have to be just found over there because of your better value proposition either they may select you or to the sub segment of those users you may say that for this use case we are better for example if you are a marketing automation software you might say that for d2c brand we are the best marketing automation software where there may be certain nuances around that category so i think getting answer to those questions will narrow down to either uh, you reaching out to the prospect or the prospect searching for something else and finding you right so those are the two uh, broad areas in which i would tend to think about a go to market and then in each of these you have should i do paid should i do content uh, or should i do webinar like what what all do i do and often i have seen that usually one or two channels lend themselves to be very very effective channel for that particular segment that you are going after which will work for you and you will have to try two three of them one will work the one that will works for you you scale and like in a growth as they say that each channel has a kind of a tapering shelf life so you, yeah. something that is working for you will stop working so whatever channel you bank upon you have to also make sure that you can't reinvent the channel every 3 6 months so you have to also identify that is it really a scalable channel right and then go about executing uh, on that strategy so that's been our journey in terms of how we thought about it got it manish i have a few follow up questions i'll actually get back to you but before that manan and again what specifically did you end up doing once you got to that early sort of traction stage uh, at at recruiter flow sure yeah i mean see uh, so manish's answer is completely uh, you know uh, is very very right right like you you kind of have to think uh, who, where where uh, you know the journey uh, at which point right like your prospect discovers you right like uh, whether uh, they don't realize that they have a problem yet that they realize that they have a problem but they don't know what to solve and in existing categories right like where we operate they know they that they know that they have they have this problem they have uh, a budget for it um and uh, it's about uh, picking the best uh, uh, option uh, available to them right so um specifically in case of recruiter flow we were uh, in that uh, third category um so that means that uh, uh, you know there is there is already a lot of intent uh, by intent in the market um and uh, we just went after it right like uh, initially when uh, uh, there wasn't uh, enough budget uh, you know whatever we could find right like there are uh, core answers all that that we could find we were would go there answer uh, those questions um and uh, uh, uh once you have the budget you kind of uh, uh, so google adwords is a good um you know proxy for uh, understanding the amount of intent uh, in the market and uh, just go out uh, and uh, capture them uh, so that's basically has been uh, uh, you know uh, our uh, uh, you know gtm scaling strategy um and on your earlier uh, question about you know who do you hire i think that also kind of depends uh, on the same thing right like if 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 your if the problem if the problem is identified solution is identified and your job is to you know uh, make yourself as the number one solution in your prospect's mind uh, 
you know, uh, you, 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 you need to hire uh, first for, uh, you know, you as a founder, I, I generally suggest everybody that, you know, uh, own as much of uh, customer conversation as you can uh, until it starts breaking, right? And at the time it starts breaking, uh, understand what your, uh, uh, you know, specialties are, right? like what are the things that you can do yourself to uh, scale better. So uh, in our case, we we knew that we can uh, scale, I can scale marketing pretty well. I had uh, uh, a lot of experience with it. So uh, our early hires were, uh, you know, on the sales side, like uh, A's and SDRs and things like that. And then uh, we started, uh, uh, you know, uh, scaling on the marketing. But if you, as a founder, are, you know, more marketing oriented than sales oriented, then you can uh, go the other way around. Got it. And Manish, going back, I think uh, in your case, specifically at Hivo, uh, what kind of choices did you make in terms of, what functions did you hire for and why uh, once you started building out the go-to-market function? Yeah. As and in we put it into context, we are talking about literally at the beginning of your journey, as you are beginning to make the first hire. So what at that time, what choices did you make? Yeah. So um, we actually did two things, right? One was, and by, de by default, if you see, if you are going into a new category, in our case, we were almost kind of going after a new category. We did not know even if it's called a new category or it was like a redefinition or a, a reset of the category of sorts where you move from on-prem to cloud. Uh, so by the natural journey, when you are on to trying to find whether this hypothesis that I have is valid or not, you naturally try to reach out to people uh, talk to them, get the customer validation. So before you even think about GTM, you were trying to define your hypothesis. And while you're trying to define your hypothesis, the next stage for you is to validate those hypotheses. So at that stage, you basically reach out to people and say that from some customers, I've heard that this is a problem typically companies have. Do you have this problem or not? So in those scenarios, by definition, you have this uh, clearly kind of a, a uh, super early version of an outbound kind of a motion that you are reaching mm -hmm. out to people, articulating the problem statement and trying to understand the perspective of those problems. So your first five, 10, 20 customers are going to be through that route in itself. Now, the problem where it actually breaks is that if your price points are not really conducive for you to scale that motion, right? So if your price points are conducive to scale that motion, then you are going to hire more people who, who will uh, reach out to you in a very similar way as you are doing. Then you will hire outbound SDRs. You will hire uh, at an early stage. You will be the one who will be giving the demos and converting the customer, et cetera. But if your price points are not very high, then you understand that, okay, I have understood that this is the user who has this problem. This is the way they look at this problem, but I cannot reach out to everyone and convince them because the uh, amount of money that each customer is going to be paying very low. So you have to then figure out that how are those users going to come and find you, right? Rather than you going out. So if, if you are, if your motion is enterprise that what your customer development journey will look like that in itself will be a natural linear path to your go to market. If it turns out that your market is not enterprise and it might so happen that you might think that your market is enterprise and it may turn out to be that enterprise companies don't have this need or you, they don't want to buy from you yeah. and they have to go after a different segment of the user, in which case your go-to-market will have to change. So we actually had this motion that we had a bunch of customers who were reasonably large customers who were uh, willing to buy from us. We successfully converted them, but, uh, and it was very natural for us to, to continue on that path uh, and hit $1 million ARR mark, which was kind of, uh, the uh, gold standard at that point in time that that shows that you you basically have something that the world wants. Uh, but almost about at 600, 700K, we stopped doing what we were doing because we figured out that you can get to, you, you are basically looking at what is the path to get to 100 million onward yeah. and upward journey. Not 1 million is like a milestone to a journey in itself is not a destination itself. 
So we said that if we have to repeatedly bring more customers, right? And at an early stage, what you have to be very, very obsessively focused about is that uh, it is all about repeatability. So I figured out that the first 700K of ARR that I got, I put in all kind of uh, <coughs> creativity that I can put as a founder to do an enterprise sales, et cetera, et cetera. I figured out that if I have to bring someone and tell him that do the same thing that I have done, the probability of me finding that person is very, very rare. So if, if the, the entire go-to market starts looking like a neurophysics uh, <laughs> of sorts, then you are basically not really creating a business. You are basically trying to do something which is not going to scale. So you have to ultimately boil it down to like a playbook, which others will be able to execute. And I could figure out that I will not be able to find people who will have, have the head of founder will be a technology expert on the fly can answer all these deep questions and be able to sell. So at that stage, we took a step back and see that we have to sell to the mid market where the repeatability is very high and we can't have like so much of deep technical expertise um, at a price point, which, which we are trying to sell, right? So if you're selling a hundred K deal, you can bring a solution expert who will do the technical talk. Your salesperson will open the doors, but if you're doing it at 20 K deal, that is not feasible. So what go to market works also has kind of a uh, feedback loop to how you are architecting your product and your product go to market and team kind of have to tune to kind of become a flywheel. Otherwise you will build a go to market of a different sort. You will have a different kind of customers coming and evaluating your product and your product will not be rightly fit to serve that customer. And then you are basically like uh, struggling with taking your business scale off you, your business will not die because you are getting somehow some customers and uh, your business will not scale up because you haven't really fine tuned that engine for it to really go off well. Got and it. then we basically move to the whole building that inbound engine model, which continues to scale for us and delivers a lot of inbound uh, traffic and the demand for us. But that was the journey that we took in the early days. Yeah. And Very I Ah, wait a minute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the same um, uh, what Manish was saying, right? Like uh, at about 600K, what happened with them? Um, very similar kind of mistakes uh, we've uh, also made, right? Like uh, um, there were things that uh, I could do uh, uh, as a founder, which worked really, really well. So, you know, um, I, I was, uh, uh, when COVID hit, almost all inbound was uh, basically gone from the market. So we started doing outbound and I could do it uh, really, really well. But, uh, and one of the first most intuitive things that one thinks about when they think about scaling is that, hey, how do I create replicas of myself, which is the most, uh, which is basically impossible to do. So, um, and it's a, that's the mistake that uh, we made as well. And uh, I, I see a lot of uh, other uh, people making a very similar kind of mistakes. And uh, it's, it's you, you have to start thinking. Uh, so initially, it's great to do things that don't really scale very well, get to that particular uh, point of PMF. But after that, uh, you basically have to start thinking about, okay, how does, you know, how, how do I, uh, you know, can, can I create a formula of input versus uh, uh, output, uh, uh, you know, uh, ratio, right? Like, hey, this goes in, this comes out. Um, and uh, that's that's what your job becomes uh, as, a, as a founder. Understood. One last question that I will just have as a common question for both of you. I know we are running slightly behind what you normally would. And post that, we will open it up to questions from the audience. I have a longer list also, by the way. But when did you guys hire your first customer success person? And initially, did you think this was like a go-to market function or a product function? Okay, so I'll take that up uh, first. So we hired our first customer success person uh, just about a year back. Uh, so um, at that time, uh, uh, to us, uh, it was mostly a gtm had even right now we look at uh, cs as a as a as an extension uh, of gtm rather uh, 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 than the product of course there is a lot of uh, product uh, uh, involved uh, uh, with them um so uh, our 
customers. So, the, you know, so again, we are a, a workflow software. So uh, customer success became very, very important in terms of, you know, helping people uh, set up their accounts, uh, uh, you know, get the best out of uh, recruiter flow uh, day in and day out, right? And uh, um, when, when you are trying to uh, introduce something new, something, a new way of doing things in a very old uh, industry, right? Like uh, changing uh, the way that people think becomes uh, uh, becomes very important, right? Like we want to lead with a uh, uh, product uh, on that front and customer success is a function that uh, does that really, really well for you. And, really helps so we we saw like clear cut jump on our nps on our adoption uh, everything once we started thinking um of uh, customer uh, success right like once uh, the money hits the bank how do we uh, prepare our customers uh, to uh, succeed with recruiter flow understood what about you manish and post that guys by the way please do if at all there are questions or if you want to join the panel Please do either raise your hands and put questions on the Q&A panel. But yeah. We didn't have a, a customer success function all the way up till two months back. And we are still not sure that still it's an experiment stage. I think a lot of times it's a very generic advice and there is nothing more dangerous than the generic advice without applying in the context that, I mean, you should always over invest in a customer success, et cetera. And for the sake of it, like I've seen teams go and like build a customer success. I think what is important is to go back to the first principle and the drawing board and say that customer has bought my software, right? This is basically an intention from the customer side that if my problem is solved, I'm willing to pay money for it. But then the next question is that how are we going to deliver on that promise? Is there anything else needed beyond product for me to make this customer successful? And the answer to that question will actually vary quite a lot with respect to the product and the person who is going to use it. So often you will realize that there are products where the users themselves are very uh, proficient in terms of how to use the product that they really don't, uh, in fact, they don't appreciate or they don't like any humor intervention. You call them up that, do we give you a demo? Do we do this and say that, look, I've got the product send me the documentation. I have access to the API. If I need any help, I'll come back to you. You don't, you don't need to come to me. Yeah. So I don't have time to engage into a conversation. Now there could be other type of softwares and we've seen this within our own organization across different persona. Uh, compare that with like a sales org, which has got CRM and they are trying to build a certain type of reports. So if they have an expert at their fingertip who can come and demonstrate to them, they really appreciate all those things. Or if they could really come and tell them that these are the best practices, then it's a very different thing altogether. So it all depends on what do you really need to make the customer successful. In our case, the answer was a very prompt live chat support when the customer needs it. So not from our side, but when the customer needs it. A great documentation where all kinds of questions that customers would typically come across while trying to use the product to solve their problems, those, those should be easily available, well-documented and discoverable for the customer from within the product when they are trying to uh, use the product. So that's how we've seen uh, the role of customer success. Understood. And another thing to think about is, do you have an upsell potential, right? Like, do you have, multi if you have multiple tiers uh, and, you know, if, if, if you are doing anything like land and expand uh, kind of a thing, customer success actually um, I, I know certain companies where customer success actually brings in more revenue than the sales thing, right? So they are very typical land and expand kind of uh, uh, motions. Um, and but yes, it's it's uh, it's very important to think about what kind of business uh, you are in, uh, and that's where uh, you know all of this kind of stems from, right? Like where do you where do you hire the marketing person first, sales person first, CS person first? It's 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 a function of what you are selling. Got it. I'm going to switch over to some of the questions on the Q&A panel. And I am assuming, actually, I so there is there are two questions from Kesman, but I think there are actually one question, which is directed at Manish, which is, how did you figure out who buys the P2P product in a scenario where one, the user and the buyer are different? And also in a scenario where unless you see the product, for example, Watflix, you will not be able to understand how 
basically that problem will actually help solve any problems with your business and you know did you sell to the buyer or the user so and i think manish i'm sure you can also have a look at the question if we can take this one up and i think there are a few more that has started coming on as well yeah so i think don't think about who will buy your product think about who has the problem in the organization so it, it is i mean one thing very fundamentally uh, in a b2b setup it is not about you but it is about the prospect or the customer that you're solving for right who buys your product will be determined by who has a problem right and if that problem is solved who will get benefited right and who is responsible for solving that problem right uh so for example if uh let's say if you want a reporting solution so the top management is the one who wants that right who has a problem an analyst who is basically responsible for preparing the report has a problem who can solve it likely an engineer who has to bring in the data from different systems so that the analyst can do that so typically i think when it when it when it comes to the putting these buckets who is the buyer who is the economic buyer who is the beneficiary i think when you put it like hard bucket you like miss out the nuances of what your category is all about you have to understand that who is the one who actually has a problem who can be your internal champion that business will get benefited if this problem is solved right you have to first get hold of that person and that person will guide you to that that who is the person who is responsible for doing that and then you have to go towards doing that once you do this enough number of times across different size of organizations different industries you will start uh, developing a pattern that typically who is the person who has to be my first entry point and then go from there on now as you go along you will realize that for different categories some of these role may spread across two or three different type of individuals um, within the organization or it may just get compressed to one or two people within the organization but most important is the entry point which has to be the person who is pained by this problem not being solved got it understood you know amit had raised his hand but i think he has dropped off so in the meantime uh, uh, hello, i wanted to chime in um, uh, and the only reason i want to chime in is that i have a different opinion than both manan and manish on a question you asked earlier which is on when to hire your customer success person hmm right um and again i know there are different kinds of products and therefore no sort of single uh, single sort of answer suffices for everyone and especially if it's a plg kind of a motion a lot of these will be solved by the product you would imagine and not necessarily by a person and i also agree with manish that by and large for developer products uh or infra products people don't want to be bugged and they don't want to be called you give them the documentation give them the apis they will try it if they have a question they'll come back to you so be available to them whether you on a slack channel or something else but for a large category of products i actually believe that customer success should be one of the first functions we should set set up because what you are indexing on is not the efficiency of your motion at that point in time you are basically trying to convince not even the customer but yourself first can i deliver value right forget what you have to tell to your investors or, or anybody else you are building a company on the foundation that there is a problem that i can solve and my product does solve it and customer success is where that magic happens and very often it will be the founders involved in that early on clearly but the moment you go beyond just a few customers it becomes very hard from a bandwidth perspective for just the founder to be there even if they are junior people actually i think it is worth having uh, customer success very early on one nuance i'll actually make here is that the role of customer success is very different in the early stages versus as you begin to grow to manan's point you know you might have multiple pricing plans so there might be land and expand motion and customer success will help you do that that comes actually later but if i really go to the very early stage of the company at that point customer success is actually more of a product function you are trying to you new customer problems because you talk to them but now that your product is out there you are seeing it in with, with a slightly different light and you need people who can pass on the feedback internally to make sure that you are veering towards product market fit so people who can help you do that are the ideal profile you are not necessarily looking for a sales capability in those people um, so product mindset oriented people usually become the best customer success people in the very early stages and it's hard to define what does very early mean but i would 
again, I'm just going to hazard a guess that if you look at the zero to 500K range, that's the stage you need those kind of people. Beyond that, you need the classical customer success people and who are helping you get new, uh, new revenue, reducing churn, all the classical metrics that you were uh, attached with. But anyway, I wanted to put it out there just because I had a slightly different view on it. That's all. Actually, I had a follow-up question to what Manish had mentioned on customer success and given Alok, you mentioned it. Uh, I'll ask it now itself. I'm curious, given that we started running the experiment on customer success two months ago, what prompted us to actually run that experiment? Uh, given we have, I mean, we haven't had customer success for quite a while at Kivo, but now that you have started doing it, with the book, where did the thinking come from? What are we trying to assess? I think that is just the part of the natural framework. We just don't want to. So what we've realized over a period of time is that there are no permanent truths in a business. What is true today may not be true two years down the line. So everything that doesn't work today, just by virtue of being scientific in our approach, we go back and say that let's do this same thing again after a certain stage. Doesn't matter. There's no trigger, but just that we don't know yet. Right. So you, I mean, in one of the most important aspect, not just in your journey to PMF, but just your survival as a company, even when you are at 1 billion ARR, is that what is that I don't know that my customers Understood. want, right? So you go and do that. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that when you are in a very early stage of your journey, oftentimes you don't know whether your strategy was wrong or your execution was wrong. The person who was executing that project, right? As a founder, you can't do everything. A lot of times you will see that the person who was doing that did not have the belief in that and it will not work. So you will have a wrong conclusion. So from time to time, you have to keep trying that this thing a, out. That is such an, I mean, I just couldn't agree more with <laughs> that part that you just said, Manish. I think uh, I was just talking to a friend yesterday who runs a reasonably scaled business in a reasonably scaled startup. Uh, and I've heard this from several other folks that look, just because we tried it once and it didn't work, that doesn't mean it is not worth trying again. And a very large percentage of the times is the fact that either the enablement of the team that was going, it was not right, or we didn't even pick the right team to go about to fight that battle. That look, as you said, the person didn't have belief, didn't have the skill set. Uh, so understood. Yeah, and but sometimes it's just bad timing, right? Like, I mean, we, we, uh, I remember we tried, in fact, Arpit, you had connected me with uh, one of your friends to try uh, and scale uh, AdWords as a channel, acquisition channel when we were, we were at about 250. I think that was, yeah, that, that was a little while back. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a while back, but like at that time it was, you know, it was a, a flop experiment. And then we said, okay, a year, year, year has passed since and uh, um, you know, why don't we try again? And it's been uh, today, I think about one third of our uh, uh, acquisitions come from uh, AdWords as a channel, right? So it's, uh, uh, it, these things keep changing so much uh, and it's, it's, it's generally good to kind of, you know, uh, keep experimenting with all these different things every once in a while. Got it. One other question. Alok, sorry, you want to say something? No, no, I was going to ask a question as well, but uh, please go ahead. Uh, channels have a tapering time. Actually, there's one which at least I found very interesting. How do we go about finding new channels every four to five months? I'm not even sure if it is relevant for all channels, uh, but would just like to pose that to both of you. So is the question that how do you go about finding the next channels? Yes. So... And how do you do it with such a high frequency or whatever, or what is the frequency in your mind? I think it was part of the question too. That's right. Yeah. So I think um, the one way to think about is that know that your channel is going to tap, die down, not even taper. Let's assume that, like, I mean, uh, Andy Grove rightly said that paranoid survive. Assume that if paid is working, suddenly someone will with more money will come and make it uneconomical for you to bid on that, right? Or assume your Google algorithm will change and it will die down, right? So at each stage, you have to have like a team which is keeping the lights on and which is working and they are happy. Uh, oh, we are doing great. But then there is a team which is out there to, like they are the underdogs within the company saying that why does like the paid get so much attention and why can't outbound work? And those set of people who are just there to prove that there is like, there's just no one way to do it. 
and those are the, those are the side set of people who really drive and make some of the channel work and like you have to have kind of twin engine which is in in a very healthy way competing it's not competing for the same resource but you say that look let's say i'm spending say $100000 on a particular channel how about like let me just spend another $25000 to someone else right doesn't matter what you do with that but do something that you can bring learning at least you eliminate the uh, channels that we for sure know won't work right try webinars and prove either prove it works or prove it doesn't work right so there are only finite seven or eight different channels that work there are no like it's not a b2c kind of a thing that you have a large permutation combination there are finite ways in which gtm works you have to go and test and you have to have a catalog of sorts that what we did what it worked what was the learnings in what scenario it will work so that's kind of a constant exercise that you have to keep doing for you to really do well as a business because when you will hit a peak or was sort of like a hit a wall at that stage if you are starting to think you will be under a lot of pressure and this experimentation team manish do you think it should report into like the means i'm sorry i'm calling them a mainstream team and an experimentation team i'm paraphrasing what you said uh, should they be run by the same person or uh, is it better for the experimentation team to you know have a different reporting because you can always have a risk that it should it should report to the person who has a belief that it will work doesn't matter it's a mainstream non mainstream got it anything that you do should basically be do, done by someone who who desperately wants it to make it happen otherwise you will come across scenarios the smartest of the people your smartness is a double edged sword right you can convince yourself that why it cannot happen but if you use the smartness in the right way you can use that smartness to find how it will happen and not why it cannot happen so someone who has the highest conviction should own the project even if they don't have the skill set they can assemble the skill set but belief is the most important thing for any of this to work got it and also one of the things that we we have also observed is um that it's these as you expand the number of channels they kind of you know uh, they kind of start feeding into each other and uh, that's what kind of gets you into a flywheel kind of a motion right so um and you if if the if the number of choices that you have limited because of resources of for whatever reasons right like i i would first prioritize investing in channels or as at least experimenting with channels that can create that flywheel for you right so um for example let's say uh, product marketing um can can help you build a brand which can also uh, you know really really help your seo can really really help your uh, uh you know outbound uh, motion right so these are um uh, the, these are harder channels to crack but if you do there are there is a much higher uh, payoff uh, over there right so uh, it's and as as you know manish said right? like there are no hard truths if something didn't work a year year and a half back it will work again now right so you kind of have to keep experimenting with it got it yeah alok you had a question no oh, i was sorry, i was just going to add a comment to it which is that i mean part of the question was how do you know that something will not scale also and some underlying things to keep in mind is that look if any underlying variable is changing in the sense that let's say your acv is going higher gradually right uh higher acv can actually result in a different motion uh if you if the and sometimes higher acv can result for example in the in the persona that you target within the company in your prospects actually can change you might actually end up going higher up in the food chain to target which may mean again a change of motion it can also change because you decide to target a new industry or something else so you are changing the target segment yourself uh, or you might be adding a product or you're changing some product capabilities because of which again that segment can change and any of those changes effectively mean that you have to uh, you have to figure out a new motion and therefore the channel the sometimes the other thing which i think manish referred to in the beginning which i find it to be so true is that doesn't matter what your eventual motion is but first 5 to 20 customers are outbound that's because you are testing your hypothesis during that period by and large most companies will figure out an inbound motion post that it's a high intent motion and it changes and usually for most companies acv goes up and you find that at a particular time you end up switching again not even if not switching 
you end up adding an outbound motion to an existing inbound motion. Right? So some of those are natural sort of crossover points that we see repeatedly most, uh, most startups go through. The magic numbers are very sort of difficult to sort of say, okay, look, it happens at this much ARR or this much ACV, but pretty much every company has to go through it. I know there are more questions here. One question from my side, which uh, at least I've been meaning to ask for some time. Again, at this very formative stage of your GTM org, do you go for specialists or do you go for generalists? Yeah, but before I take up that question, I have this uh, link of a book I wanted to share. I mean, this whole traction, these channels, how to prioritize channel. This is one of the best books to read on that if someone is interested in uh, understanding this, I've read this and recommended to some of the other founders who've really got benefited out of it. Uh, so I just pasted the link over here. Uh, yeah, uh, Alpit, coming to your uh, uh, question, it it kind of all varies, right? Depends on a if you have a if you if you are really confident that this is is going to work. I mean, basically, if you if you are experimenting whether it will work or not, you are better off with the journalists because they are more flexible. After you determined or have had the early signs that it will work, the specialists are the answer uh, for it to scale because they have that muscle memory and they have that uh, precision of how to scale it. But the same precision can be detrimental when you are experimenting. So they will not be open to trying new different things out, etc. So uh, you have to have actually both set of people within the team. You need to have some set of journalists who are like a zero to one players. And every mm. new initiatives that you are doing will take you zero to one and you will start seeing that, okay, this is working. Then you have to bring a specialist backfill them up. They will scale it up from one to 10 and then move these zero to one people to a different, it's like in, in uh, one day internationals you have, right? Players who can finish the game and players who can build the innings. So it's of that sort. Got it. Interesting. Uh, I, I have not, no no further thing to add to that. It's, it's, Arpit, it's sorry, I wanted to add to it that hmm. um, I agree uh, conceptually with Manish, but over time, I'm also sort of changing my opinion slightly on this. And I, I'll take an example, therefore. Many people would begin with hiring one person in sales who usually does both demand gen, anyway plays the SDR role and account executive role. I've seen that as a very common thing many startups end up doing. Over time, at least my view is that rather than the minimum viable being actually one, you actually begin with two. Separate SDR and account executive from day zero. Why? Because they're different skill. You ask an account executive to spend time as an SDR in the sense of doing qualification, that's not a good use of their time. Sometimes they might, they might not be good at it and vice versa as well, right? Of course, it depends on how much money you have in the bank, whether you can experiment with that or not. And, but I would rather separate those roles early on as opposed to sort of putting them in a generalist bucket uh, uh, early on. The second part, that same uh, thing I'm beginning to notice on the marketing side as well. I find, for example, outbound skill to be very different than inbound and then very different than content. And um, while as a founder, you will choose as to what time you want to begin to initiate these motions. But sometimes it's very much like, you know, asking a front end engineer to code back end is very hard and vice versa. And therefore, I'm finding that even in sales or marketing, some of these roles are actually harder to mix and better to take a call what you will do versus not do versus actually putting it into a generalist kind of a bucket. So, the, I mean, that, that's true. And one of the risks, right? Like it, it's, it's uh, it, it, I, I generally err on the side of uh, uh, what Manish has said, but one of the risks that you run with it is what, you know, what we talked about earlier, right? Like you, you tried, a channel you tried an experiment uh, there are two reasons that it can fail right like one that uh, the channel itself is not right and the second the person running uh, it was not right, right? and when you are you are taking that risk with uh, generalists but um, you know we we are uh, the assumption here uh, that i have is that when you are super early stage you are running in a little bit of uh, you know uh, resource constrained uh, kind of an environment if if that is the uh, environment that you operate in i you know i would err on the side of a uh, generalist and then once we have a science of uh, you know this thing can scale well uh, put a specialist behind it yeah 
Arpit, if I may take a question from the audience now. Uh, yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, question from Dhir, and I know he has posted on the on the chat group and also on the Q&A panel. And please, either one of you feel free to take it, which is that I would like to understand if there are any insights about us, how a SaaS solutions company currently focusing on in the Indian market can explore this sellability or a product market fit, I guess, outside India. Uh, and he's saying that, look, we do believe that our solution has applicability outside, but not sure how to go about it. Do we need to hire someone in that geography or can we explore that from India itself? Are there any best practices on this? Yeah, so, Jeet, uh, could you, like, if you could explain a little bit more on uh, the nature of the product so we can make it more contextual because, again, I don't want to give a framework of sorts answer, but if you have something specific, if you could explain uh, the solution that is there, then we can take it up from that. And I'm just seeing if you know, it might be hard because huh. he's put it on the Q&A panel. Yeah. B2B platform for consumer goods. For the brand. consumer goods brands. Yeah, I just, thank you. Thanks, Manan. Yeah. So I think the very, very important factor is that each, and we've seen this, I mean, uh, quite a times so I've uh, like uh, some of the friends who tried doing this, right? Uh, a classic example I give is that look at car, right? Now you fundamentally will think that what is the car? Car is a machine that is responsible for moving man and material from point A to B in an efficient way and a safe way. But you realize that every country that you go to, there are no same brands and same models existing in the same country. You go to US and look at India, the intersection of the same model is zero. The reason for this is that the reason why people buy something is very different. So we look at a very functional side of things, right? But the practical reality is that the environment in which that business operates, when I talk about environment, environment within the company, how that is structured, who the customers are, what their landscape is, and is that the really top problem for them to solve or not, right? And if those conditions continue to remain the same, then it is more likely to work uh, than the other way around. So compared to say, let's say if you build a developer tool, which basically helps you rate the quality of your code, it doesn't matter whether that developer is sitting in Bangalore or uh, uh, Bay Area. But when it comes to say the retail part of it, like let's say there's a company where there are category managers who are uh, working on it. Now the typical category manager is someone in India who either would have been an engineer who did an MBA and went on to work at Flipkart. Their acumen of how to look at their merchandising is very different compared to when you look at a typical category manager in the US because they will come from a merchandising buying background uh, predominantly. Now there'll be uh, all kind of people. So then the value prop of your product in itself might vary a lot, right? So how you structure your product, how does the onboarding happen? All those things tend to change a lot. And consequently, like, I mean, this is one of the best advice that we ever got in our journey was that just go and live in the city in which you want to sell the product, not the country, in the city in which you want to sell the product, because you realize that every single thing is so different. When I was starting Hevo, I was staying in the US and I would see that even at the gas station, people will like fill up their own uh, uh, gas and swipe the card. Now, that is an example when we were thinking that we will like at a say $500 a month product or a $1,000 a product, we will give a demo, we will do the implementation for them. Just doesn't make sense. It will sound very fishy to the customer that, look, I mean, why would someone do all of this for me at $500? They are used to buying a self serve So where you would invest would be your documentation, your APIs, and not having people who can give the demo and the salespeople, right? So like for first one, I think it was $1.5 million when we reached, we had zero salespeople, right? Because we did not need salespeople. And the people that we hired, people, people would not even come for a demo call with them. They'll say, is the product not good enough that I have to talk to the salesperson? So that was the kind of a very strong uh, and a contradictory statement. And hence, these geographical factors actually do play a huge role. Yeah, and answering your second uh, second part of your question, you can absolutely build that, uh, in my experience, right? Like you can ex absolutely build it from India, unless you are selling, you know, very high touch 
um, uh, kind of a, a sales model. Uh, you can practically sell from India to uh, uh, any any geography. Now, you you said you know with you you said it's a platform, so I'm going to assume it has demand and supply both sides. That might be a little bit difficult uh, to do because it's a chicken and egg problem to solve. But uh, um, uh, but other than that, right? Like uh, uh, ordinary SaaS product, you can absolutely sell from India. It's just you will have to do a lot of unlearning, um, as as uh, Manish uh, said, right? Like they, uh, you know, there are cultural nuances. They expect things to, uh, uh, you know, uh, expect uh, a lot of, uh, you know, things to work on its just own, so that they can figure it out themselves. Uh, you don't really want uh, to be handheld uh, for a very long time, but uh, um, you know. Definitely, uh, you don't need to go either. You don't need to hire somebody over there to sell. Understood. Uh, one more question from the Q and A panel, and actually, the reason I'm picking this up is because it's a follow-on to the discussion on the tapering of channels that you are discussing, which is. any examples of when you found an early indicator that the channel will work but then when we actually started double down it didn't work uh, and how can we in some sense figure out how to avoid these kind of mistakes yeah i i don't think it's the right way to think of them as a mistake uh, it's an experiment when you are starting up think as an experiment and experiment by definition will have a higher probability of failure baked in so don't worry about that the classic example of that is there was this whole p2p review kind of a thing and you might think that okay i will if i list over here i will get certain leads and those algorithms are designed in a way that on a first month they will uh, direct most of their traffic to your listing and you will get more sign up now you might be very excited that if i'm spending uh, let's say $5000 and i'm getting 500 leads so if i spend $100000 that will multiply in that ratio it may so happen that it is not because just assume that most channels and i'm putting it a caveat most channels are non linear right some channels will have a diminishing return actually most channels will have a diminishing return because if that channel is working for you it will also it will get discovered by your competition as well and as more people are trying to go through that channel it will clog it's like the bangalore traffic so if there is a shortcut route be assured that in 3 months most people will figure that out and that will become the choked road so the channels are very similar to that to so, usme one follow up question manish is what is i understand right as you said it's ultimately an experiment right and as when we define an experiment we also define success metrics or failure metrics for experiments so when we are trying out a new channel right what are good success metrics to make sure that we don't get excited too soon but also that we don't give up too soon because some channels may take longer to mature any any useful just sort of more empirical evidence that you or manan also for that matter have found useful i think the best is to talk to other people who gone on that road right so talk to other people who use the same channel and they will tell you lot of pitfalls around it you and you can actually avoid lot of pitfalls because the good part about in a b2b is that each journey is not very unique as a business as a founder mm -hmm. the journey is very unique as a business the if if your customer is buying a certain channel your competitor is also selling through that channel at the same acv to the same customer so there is lot of learning available from the market you can either you when you are interviewing people be very curious just don't just interview people to judge them be curious to learn right so when you talk to other people learn what did you learn what worked what was the learning and generally build relationship with people around the industry and the great part about the india saas is that uh, unlike a b2c is that we are not competing against each other we are all outsiders trying to make a dent uh, in the world right so here i have found the entrepreneurs the marketers the sales people lot more helpful than any other industry that i have been part of uh, so you can talk to people and they will tell you that it worked up it up until this point and this happened etc so you know that you can narrow down on the things that you can try and see what works for you and what not got it no thank you manan anything to add on that one i you know uh, 
absolutely uh, agreed to uh, Manish on that front. And another thing that you know, it's it's um, it's cliched, but we generally take a gut call on that. That like, you know, we, we like we we have failed uh, uh, with uh, outbound. Uh, so we succeeded very early. Um, then we started uh, uh, failing with our outbound motion. Um, and uh, you know, about three four months in, we know that okay, there are. These are the reasons why it's it's not working for us right now. A year later, these things will change. We'll try again, right? So, uh, uh, you know, I don't really have a framework around that yet. But uh, you know, e once we feel like we have, you know, invested sufficient capital uh, effort um, as well as uh, talent in it, and it's still not working, maybe there is, you know, it's just not right timing for us right now. Got it. Even that we have two minutes, I wanted to sneak in a question for Manan, if you're okay, Arpit. Go ahead, Arok. And it's a special one for Manan because uh, the the question is that does B2B SaaS need a growth team like B2C business, uh, like Airbnb, and have you experimented? What did you run? Because you are a growth guy in your last end, so and now you're a B2B guy. would love to just understand. What Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there is there is... Um, you know, there is this term uh, out there in the market consumerization of SaaS, right? Like there is the, the buying decisions, the way, uh, you know, uh, at least the workflow software, right? Like what uh, B2B users are expecting, all of that is is changing very, very drastically. And a lot of those concepts apply very, very well, right? So uh, one of the things that is now very uh, uh, you know, uh, like product-led growth uh, and uh, uh, PLQs are something that, you know, a lot of SaaS companies are looking at very, very closely. Um, if you remember, there was some time back, there was this uh, whole article about how Facebook uh, went about finding their, uh, you know, like seven friends in first week or something like that was yeah. the right trigger uh, of, you know, that user will stick around and th th those triggers, those, those tactics work really, really well in a lot of B2B uh, settings as well. So uh, uh, my answer to that is resounding yes. And Manan, is that a dedicated team or is that the same set of tactics, but you know, part of it is a customer success team, which is looking at user metrics and figuring out how behavior is happening across accounts. And that's literally the last thing I think we'll have time for, but uh, because I've, we do promise to end on time, that's all. Um, yeah, no, uh, to me, it, it, once you hit a certain scale, it's a dedicated team. Got it. And with that, uh, you know, we always promise that Friday evening, so this is 6 p.m. on the dot, uh, you know, we will draw this one to a close as well. Uh, thank you, Manan and Manish for, for taking out the time. And also thank you to everybody else for making the time and, uh, and look forward to having uh, another one of these soon. So, yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Alok. And thanks, Arpit, uh, for this platform. I think I've been sort of like, I mean, this is like kind of the masterclass course on how to like think content as like the really value. And this format actually is quite good. I mean, I haven't seen too many formats as good as for SaaS coming out of India. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, that you so that means means Thank a lot you. to us. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Arpit. Manan, great chatting with you. And you too. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.